Well, I think we're about ready to get started again. Well, I suspect that most of us are intellectually full. We're about to be running over with our final presentation of the day, although remember that this evening we have a very special time having to do with the various film presentations, and uh, Doug Gresham will be with us again for that, so we want to remember that. However, for our concluding presentation this afternoon, we have Dr. Hal Poe, who is professor at Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, and a well-known scholar. His subject, when you look at it, you might say, well, what on earth does that have to do with this man of great imagination, C.S. Lewis? Because that's not what we would think of when we think of science and technology. Nevertheless, Hal is going to show us what the relevance is of that, and it's a very important subject. So. Dr. Hal Poe. Just a couple of quick announcements. Every uh, spring since uh, 2001, Don King and I, I have led a retreat here in Montreat, the Inklings Weekend, uh, start Friday night, end Sunday at lunch. If you're interested in... Um, uh, information about that, I'll leave this uh, sign-up sheet down here on the front, and you can sign your name and an email or phone number, and we'll send you information about it. Point number two, uh, Melissa and Russ Kilpatrick have put out a number of these uh, little booklets about C.S. Lewis. They're free, and you can get more to uh, distribute if you would like to introduce people to Lewis. They're in the... Um, vestibule, as the Baptist would say, um, out by the registration desk on a table. So pick one up before you leave. And be sure and go by the Presbyterian Heritage Center and see the exhibits. There's some fabulous things over there. I'm not using uh, PowerPoint today because um, I wanted to be more tactile. And so I'll read a paragraph and then y'all run over to the uh, center and see the object, then come back here, I'll read another paragraph, and then y'all go back over and see it. And my talk, I've timed it, it's about nine and a half minutes long, but it should take the full hour. Um, now, have you ever had one of those awful, awful nightmares where you saw doom coming? You were going to fall off a cliff or something dreadful was going to happen to you. You know what the kind I'm talking about? And then you wake up just before it happens. Aren't those awful? I had one of those nightmares. I dreamed I was at a C.S. Lewis conference and I was asked to speak. And you know those kind where you're, you're asked to do something and it's just going to be awful. But here's, here's the setup. Before I was speaking, Diana Glyer stood up and she gave this brilliant, scintillating, insightful lecture. And then Crystal Downing stood up and she was witty and brilliant and energetic. And then Don King stood up. And not only was he brilliant, he made us think we were brilliant because we could finally understand poetry. And then Jerry Root stood up and wasn't just brilliant, he made heaven come down. Fortunately, I woke up. <laughs> now, the subject, as John suggested, is a bit out of what we've been doing. I mean, it would be grand to talk about Narnia or, or Middle Earth or um, so many of the, the, the things that we love to talk about, uh, mere Christianity. Um, this is a subject that Lewis mentioned in Mere Christianity in a particular chapter. He said something to this effect. Have you ever read a book 
that you got to a chapter and it was just such drudgery and it was just so ghastly that the only reason you kept reading the chapter was a sense of duty and obligation, but you'd really rather just skip it? Well, this is one of those chapters, and if it doesn't interest you, just skip it. It's the chapter on science. So, here we go. Brace yourselves. From his childhood days, C.S. Lewis had a fascination with science that only increased when his father introduced him to the science fiction of H.G. Wells. Eventually, the pleasure he derived from science fiction led to a challenge between Lewis and his friend J.R.R. Tolkien. They would both try their hand at science fiction. Lewis would write about space travel and Tolkien would write about time travel. Lewis immediately put his hand to the plow and produced Out of the Silent Planet. In short order, in 1937, while poor Tolkien made a failed attempt with a modern story called The Lost Road, before casting it aside and thankfully embarking on a new hobbit tale that would become the Lord of the Rings. While essays and sermons and lectures allow the author to explain and inform and attack and persuade, a story allows an author to show and to touch someone at their feelings. By turning to science fiction long before he tried his hand at apologetic, uh, rationalistic apologetics, Lewis indicated where his heart lay. By 1937, he knew that he was a storyteller and not a philosopher. And that was his choice. At the end of World War II, he explained to a group of youth ministers while discussing apologetic issues related to science that the best apologetics is not little Christian books, but little books by Christians on every subject, but with their Christianity latent. Lewis had learned this approach through his own scholarship, particularly in The Allegory of Love, 1936, which he began writing several years before he became a Christian, and which he finished writing a few years after becoming a Christian and in a preface to Paradise Lost, and in The Abolition of Man. These were all scholarly works. As for science, Lewis took the view that Christians intent on representing Jesus Christ to the world should stay abreast of scientific advances and changes in thought. During his lifetime, Lewis witnessed the scientific revolutions that came with Einstein's theory of relativity, Niels Bohr's quantum theory, Edwin Hubble's Big Bang theory, and the revisions to Darwin's theory of natural selection following the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick. He was familiar with them all. He was reading Arthur Eddington, Whitehead, Haldane, F.B. Hoyle, and many, many others. He thought it was important to keep up because the current scientific attitude toward Christianity was constantly changing even as the science changed. Because of the changing science, Lewis warned against linking one's theology or apologetics to any scientific theory. Luther and Calvin had made this mistake by linking their interpretation of the Bible to Aristotle's and Ptolemy's theory of an earth-centered cosmos. Lewis took the view that sentences beginning with science has now proved should be avoided. Lewis had not originally developed his knowledge of science as a Christian who wanted to be aware of something at work in the culture. Instead, he approached science as a passionate disciple who worshipped at the altar of Darwin and Freud. His interest in science preceded his conversion. When he abandoned the Christian faith in his mid-teens, he found a new belief system and a materialistic view of science which he acquired from his tutor, W.D. Kirkpatrick with whom he lived and studied between the ages of 15 and 17. As an undergraduate reading English at Oxford in the early 1920s, 
Lewis devoured the new psychology, beginning with William James's Varieties of Religious Experience, and to which he added Miller's The New Psychology and the Teacher, Rivers' Instinct and the Unconscious, Hingley's Psychoanalysis, and Havelock Ellis's Psychology of Sex. So uh, this is something he was devouring and thus very familiar with from the inside perspective of a materialist and a naturalist. In his inaugural lecture as professor of medieval and renaissance literature at Cambridge University in 1954, C.S. Lewis sought to identify the greatest point of demarcation in human history. Rejecting such gradual divides as those between the classical and medieval periods or between the medieval and the modern periods, Lewis chose instead something closer at hand. Even with the birth of modern science in the 17th century, the division had not come because the new learning had not yet affected the tone of the common mind as would happen later. Lewis explained that science was not the business of man because man had not yet become the business of science. It dealt chiefly with the inanimate, and it threw off few technological byproducts. When Watt makes his engine, when Darwin starts monkeying with the ancestry of man, and Freud with his soul, and the economist with all that is his, then the lion will have got out of his cage. Its liberated presence in our midst will become one of the most important factors in everyone's daily life. But not yet. Not in the 17th century. It is by these steps that I've come to regard as the greatest of all divisions in the history of the West, that which divides the present day from, say, the age of Jane Austen and Scott. So, um, in the period since Persuasion and the Waverly novels, Great changes had come in politics, art, and religion. But Lewis argued that the greatest transformation of culture came from a new source. He says, between Jane Austen and us, but not between her and Shakespeare, Chaucer, Alfred, Virgil, Homer, or the Pharaohs, comes the birth of the machines. This lifts us at once into a region of change far above all that we have hitherto considered. Unlike the change from stone to bronze or the change from a pastoral to an agricultural society, the machine, Lewis tells us, alters man's place in nature. Lewis focused on the psychological effect of this alteration as he asked, how has it come about that we use the highly emotive word stagnation with all its melodious and uh, malarial overtones for what other ages would have called permanence. In observing a new common mindset that regards old as bad and new as good, Lewis proposed that a new value now dominates Western thinking. Lewis argued that what has imposed this climate of opinion so firmly on the human mind is a new archetypal image. It is the image of old machines being superseded by new and better ones. For in the world of machines, the new most often really is better, and the primitive really is clumsy. And this image, potent in all our minds, reigns almost without rival in the minds of the uneducated. For to them, after their marriage and the births of their children, the very milestones of life are technological advances. In this mindset, the values of a culture that arose over thousands of years and only painstakingly emerged through the struggle are in danger of being discarded as outmoded simply because old-fashioned. As he began to elaborate on the danger of neglecting the instruction 
of the accumulated wisdom of the past, Lewis could not help slipping from what had been a straightforward scholarly address into science fiction. He slips into a parable. In his effort to explain the importance of a common received tradition, Lewis remarked, if one were giving a lecture on Warwickshire to an audience of Martians, no offense, Martians may be delightful creatures, one might loyally choose all one's data from that county. But much of what you told them would not really be Warwickshire lore, but common to Lurian. Though Lewis regarded himself as an example of old Western man, a dinosaur, a Neanderthal among modern men, he chose a form of storytelling that speaks to the heart of this newly transformed culture. In fact, I would argue that Lewis, in his own way, as well as Dorothy L. Sayers and G.K. Chesterton, are the most truly modern of storytellers, and uh, that the rest of the storytellers aren't quite, because he chose science fiction, a brand new kind of storytelling that had only been around for a century. Um, it, uh, it, it arose as a new form of story during the period that Lewis identified. That is, it started right after Jane Austen. The analysis of the great divide in human history helps us see how and why science fiction suddenly arose and is an important artifact of our culture. Though one might argue that Kepler's uh, Somnium, about 1630, and Voltaire's uh, Micromagus, 1752, could be classified as science fiction. We don't have true science fiction until Mary Shelley and Edgar Allan Poe just after the age of Jane Austen. In Shelley's Frankenstein, 1918, and in Poe's 11 science fiction stories, both authors use this new form of storytelling to explore profound questions of morality, philosophy, and theology. Inspired by Poe's stories, Jules Verne took up the new kind of story and developed many of Poe's plots into full novels. For a century after Frankenstein, however, the new kind of story struggled without the benefit of a name. Critics referred to Poe's science fiction stories as hoaxes. Frankenstein was merely gothic horror. C.S. Lewis was one of the new generation of writers who went through the Great War and who gave science fiction a name and a new lease on life. In his first letter to Charles Williams in March 1936, Lewis mentioned how Williams had treated one of the great scenarios of science fiction. I have read many dimensions with an enormous enjoyment not that it's as good as the place of the lion, but then in a sense it hardly means to be. By Jove! It is an experience when this time-traveling business is done by a man who really thinks it out. I believe all your conclusions do follow, and I never thought of being caught in that perpetual to and fro. Sister Penelope an Anglican nun who belonged to the convent of St. Mary in nearby Wantage, wrote to Lewis after reading Out of the Silent Planet. A prolific author and classic scholar, she wrote dozens of books, including translations of the early church fathers. From this initial common interest in science fiction, a significant friendship grew, and the two would correspond for years. In his first letter to her in August 1939, just a few weeks before the German invasion of Poland, Lewis discussed several aspects of Out of the Silent Planet. Uh, the letter, um, let's see. Um, well, let me take it up halfway through. The danger of West Westernism, I mean to be real. What set me about writing the book was the discovery that a pupil of mine took all that dream of interplanetary colonization quite seriously and the realization that thousands of people 
in one form or another, depend on some hope of perpetuating and improving the human species for the whole meaning of the universe. That a scientific hope of defeating death is a real rival to Christianity. To Sister Penelope in a, later, uh, a letter on November 4th, 1940, Lewis remarked, Isn't uh, fantasies good? Or is that fantastes? Or it is, is it fantasties? Nobody knows. It did a lot for me years before I became a Christian when I had no idea what was behind it. This has always made it easier for me to understand how the better elements in mythology can be a real preparatio evangelica for people who do not yet know whither they are being led. In his first letter to Sister Penelope, he had remarked on the profound spiritual ignorance of educated England and how science fiction could be an aid to evangelism in this state of cultural collapse. You will be both grieved and amused to learn that out of about 60 reviews, only two showed any knowledge that my idea of a fall of the bent one was anything but a private invention of my own. But if only there were someone with a richer talent and more leisure, I believe this great ignorance might be a help to the evangelization of England. Any amount of theology can now be smuggled into people's minds under cover of romance without their knowing it. In a letter to Ruth Pitter in January 1947, Lewis connected the dots between his love of fantasy and his love of science fiction. Pitter thought that David Lindsay had relied upon Lewis when he wrote Voyage to Arcturus. Quite the opposite was in fact the truth. In acknowledging his dependence on David Lindsay, Lewis wrote, Can you bear the truth? Voyage to Arcturus is not the parody of Paralandra, but its father. It was published a dead failure about 25 years ago. Now that the author is dead, it is suddenly leaping into fame, but I'm one of the old guard who had a treasured second-hand copy before anyone heard of it. From Lindsay, I first learned what other planets in fiction are really good for for spiritual adventures. Only they can satisfy the cravings which sends our imaginations off the earth. Or put it another way, in him I first saw the terrific results produced by the union of two kinds of fiction hitherto kept apart. The Novalis, G. MacDonald, James Stevens sort, and the H.G. Wells, Jules Verne sort. As it turns out, science fiction does not have to be about other worlds to provide a platform for exploring deep religious, moral, and philosophical issues. All kinds of science fiction provide this opportunity, as Lewis demonstrated in That Hideous Strength, which does not leave the planet. Well, Given that the hour is quickly passing, let's talk about time. It's about time. Lewis's most enduring work may in the long run, a century from now, be the Chronicles of Narnia. With the Chronicles of Narnia, Lewis demonstrated that he could explore a major scientific idea and a story that was not science fiction. It's even a story for children. One of the most notable features of the Narnia stories is the concept of time. Lewis had long been interested in time, and Einstein's insight into how time actually works in our universe. Aristotle had propounded the idea of absolute time, which dominated Western thinking for 2,300 years. Lewis did not particularly care for Aristotle, whom he called the philosopher of divisions. With the overthrow of absolute time, by Einstein's theory of relativity, Lewis had at his disposal a valuable tool with which to think and with which to imagine. When Lucy returned from her first visit to Narnia, where she spent 
hours and hours and had tea. She was shocked to realize that only a moment had passed at the professor's house. At the end of the line, the witch in the wardrobe, the children reign as kings and queens of Narnia together. They grow up into adults and forget their early years and their passage from one world to another through the wardrobe. Then one day, while out hunting, they chance, as if chance is really the right word, to come upon the lamppost in the woods and then tumble back into the wardrobe. After a lifetime in Narnia, they found it was the same day and the same hour of the day on which they had all gone into the wardrobe to hide. Prince Caspian, the second book of the Chronicles, begins with the narrator's comment that though the children had reigned for years and years upon their return to England, it all seemed to have taken no time at all. When the children return to Narnia, they find the great castle of Caraparavale in ruins and its peninsula cut off and an island. They wonder how centuries could have passed in Narnia when only one year had passed in England. Edmund concluded that once you're out of Narnia, you have no idea how Narnia time is going. Why shouldn't hundreds of years have gone past in Narnia while only one year has passed in England? This is pure Einstein. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, time is a dimension within the physical universe like height, width, and depth. In understanding the nature of time, it may be more helpful to use the word duration since time has so many connotations connected with clocks, and calendars, and when is he going to sit down? Um, Duration involves the persistence of physical matter. As such, Einstein regarded time or duration as a physical thing. The metaphysical implications of this theory are staggering. God is not physical, therefore God is not connected to time. In his radio talks during World War II and in their publication, Uh, form as mere Christianity, Lewis remarked that it was the theologians who first started the idea that some things are not in time at all. Later, the philosophers took it over, and now some of the scientists are doing the same. When Lewis said some theologians, he meant Augustine, who uh, had declared 1,600 years ago that God created time when he created the universe. Einstein essentially is putting into mathematical formula what Augustine is talking about. Thus, he distinguished between time and eternity, the quality that most corresponds to time for God. It's not the same thing, but something corresponding to what we think of as time. By scientists, he meant uh, Einstein in the world of physicists who had accepted his theory whereby they had an entirely new understanding of reality. Lewis reasoned that if God is not physical, then almost certainly God is not in time. This would mean that God does not travel through time from one moment to the next. God has no past or future in the physical world, for all moments of the physical world lie open to God simultaneously. Lewis gave the illustration of a line drawn on a piece of paper that represents the movement of time from past to future. In this illustration, God is the piece of paper. Lewis believed that this understanding of time helps in clearing up some problems of Christian teaching that people have because of their assumptions about reality. Here Lewis spoke autobiographically of his thinking before he became a Christian. It involved one of his objections to the Incarnation. If God is everywhere and keeps the universe going, then why did everything keep going when he became a baby? Lewis explained, I was assuming that Christ's life as God was in time and that his life as the man Jesus in Palestine uh, was a um, shorter period taken out of that time, just as my service in the army was a shorter period taken out of my total life. 
And that is how most of us, perhaps, tend to think about it. We picture God living through a period when His human life was still in the future, then coming to a period when it was present, then going to a period when He could look back on it as something in the past. But probably these ideas correspond to nothing in the actual facts. You cannot fit Christ's earthly life in Palestine into any time relations with His life as God beyond all space and time. Another matter that this view of time helped Lewis to understand was how humans can have free will if God knows what they will do. Lewis argued that the apparent conflict between the knowledge of God and the freedom of people arises from thinking that God is progressing along the timeline like us. The only uh, difference being that He can see ahead and we cannot. Uh, Since God is not physical and therefore outside the physical universe, He does not foresee what will happen tomorrow. He has no tomorrow. He does not foresee. He simply knows. Think about that a moment. God does not learn things. God knows. That's what omniscience is. He knows everything. Uh, He does not know what you will do. He simply knows what you do. Thus, our actions are not prescribed by prediction. In our time-space continuing, we experience the Word of God as pointing to our future, but not to God's future. God only has His own eternity, an experience unaffected, by time or space. Finally, the being of God outside of time and space suggests how God attends to the prayers of millions of people. God does not necessarily hear us all at the same time, since God has no time to hear us at all. Conversely, God has all the time in the world, none of which is needed for Him to know our prayers. Time has nothing to do with God's attention to the world and all His creatures. He does not have time. He has eternity. Lewis thought this insight of Einstein, which only added a formula to the musings of Augustine, absolutely ripping. Yet, he added a disclaimer. He was cautious not to build theology on the basis of science, since the science is always changing. For instance, The view many people have that God created the plants and animals as fully formed distinct species is not a position taught in Scripture, but by Lewis's old nemesis, Aristotle. Here he distinguishes between theology, that's human thought about God, and the actual authoritative basis for the Christian faith, the Bible. Um, So much for time. Now let's look at matter. The materialist believes that only physical matter exists. The naturalist believes there are only physical or natural causes. Lewis spent a great deal of time and effort refuting these claims and helping people understand the difference between science and philosophy. Materialism and naturalism are philosophical positions that do not arise from science. Instead, people who hold these views tend to impose them upon science as though they are the same thing and somehow logically related. If the universe is a closed system and all events and phenomena within the universe have physical causes, then even if a God of some kind exists, that God would not be involved in any way in the actual events within the closed time-space continuum think deism or pantheism. During the 1940s, in particular during World War II, Lewis devoted a great deal of effort at debunking these philosophical views that allowed no room for revelation, miracle, or any interference in the universe from God. I might even change interference to any involvement in the universe by God. He had a threefold strategy that involved his fiction writing, his popular apologetical essays, and his scholarly work. His scientific trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and That Hideous Strength, 
attack the materialist, naturalist point of view at the affective level. How does his audience feel about this subject as as Lewis describes um, Weston giving a vision of uh, unlimited expansion into the universe? He wanted his readers to feel a certain way about the materialist, naturalist agenda and to see where it leads. With his short essays published in the denominational press, he sought to give Christians reassurance about their faith in short, easily digestible bites. With his academic lectures at the University of Durham that were published as The Abolition of Man, he indicated how a thoroughgoing materialism destroyed the scholarly enterprise and replaced it with a purely social agenda to be set by whoever held the reins of power since no transcendent reality of value was recognized as an alternative to the prevailing cultural value. If there is no ultimate value, there is no truth for truth's sake, there is no pursuit of truth, what is the scholarly enterprise? To discuss the unreasonableness of materialism and naturalism, however, Lewis turned to the findings of modern science to support his views. Lewis had a good working knowledge of the proposals of Edwin Hubble regarding an expanding universe, usually called the Big Bang Theory. In defending the reasonableness of the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, Lewis reminded his audience that modern physics now understands the universe as running down. And that at one point in the past, not infinitely remote, It had all been wound up. He contrasted the universe of Aristotle that prevailed until the third quarter of the 20th century with the new cosmology. Aristotle's universe had no beginning and would have no end. The universe itself is eternal. The universe, the matter of the universe is eternal. It had no beginning, would have no end. That's Aristotle's universe that prevailed as the science of the West until the last quarter of the 20th century. It was infinite in size. It goes on forever. and Infinite number of stars. And it is infinite in duration. Furthermore, it was as fixed and static as a picture. With the measuring techniques that were not invented until the 20th century, however, Physics discovered that the universe is more like a story, Lewis tells us. More like a story with a beginning, a development, and an ending. This also sounds a little bit like his friend Dorothy L. Sayers, who had uh, just recently published uh, Mind of the Maker, in which she explores this whole idea of God as the playwright, as the dramatist, and the universe is the story he's telling. Lewis essentially charged that theologians who denied the resurrection and ascension of Jesus were antiques living in a universe that never existed. They operated out of old discredited science. They wanted the body of Jesus to behave as bodies do in the static universe of Aristotle, but the real universe that modern science is only beginning to understand is actually a magical space. It does not have only the three dimensions of Aristotle or even the fourth dimension of Einstein. Lewis explained that Arthur Schrodinger speculated, now he's dealing with quantum mechanics, that the explanation of the atom requires seven dimensions. Today that number has grown to ten dimensions, some for eleven, some fourteen. At creation, according to one version of string theory, Lewis made mention of the new understanding of the cosmos in a sermon preached at St. Jude on the Hill Church in London in 1942, when even physicists were just beginning to understand Schrodinger's ideas. In his own way, Lewis accused these theologians who abandoned the biblical testimony to the resurrection and ascension of not simply being guilty of bad theology, They were guilty of bad science. The actual nature of the universe as understood by science is critical to the materialist claim that the only thing that exists is the physical world, now understood 
as the relation of matter and energy, Lewis argued that all of the great materialist systems of the past had depended upon the view that the physical world is eternal and self-existent. That's Aristotle. David Hume in the 18th century had argued that in an eternal duration, that every possible order or position must be tried an infinite number of times. See, if you have eternity, life can arise accidentally, just eventually. Lewis declared that if anything emerges from modern physics, it is that nature is not everlasting. The universe had a beginning and it will have an end. We've only got one chance to get it right. As for the vastness of the universe, the materialist argues both sides against God. If we find life elsewhere in the universe, then the critic misstates the Christian faith and asserts that Christians claim that the earth is unique and humans the only intelligent life that God created and therefore false. If we find that we are alone, then the critic claims that life must only be an accident. To these assertions, Lewis countered that the size of the universe makes absolutely no difference at all. Um, from the time of Aristotle, Scientists had believed that the size of an object determined how fast a dropped object would fall. A big object falls faster than a small object. Um, that idea was debunked by Galileo, but it was something that was still instill, instilled in the scientific and philosophical mind. As for other life, Lewis said that the universe may be full of life that needs no redemption. It may be full of life that has been redeemed. The Bible only tells about our world, not the whole of the universe. Lewis rebuked the materialists who talk as if revelation existed to gratify curiosity by illuminating that all creation so that it becomes self-explanatory and all questions answered. Instead, Lewis said that the Bible is a practical book that relieves humanity's most urgent necessities. It does not deal with these things. While he discussed these matters logically in his essay, The Dogma and the Universe, in 1943, Lewis also addressed these issues in his science fiction trilogy, and in the Chronicles of Narnia. In both cases, he, explode, he explored su such supposals as, suppose there were another world which had endured satanic attack, as in Out of the Silent Planet. Or, suppose there were a world in which the first people did not surrender to temptation, as in Paralandra. Or, suppose there were a world of sentient animals in which God became incarnate, as in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. These are all speculations about the issues raised by the materialist, none of which challenge biblical faith in any way. Um, I'm going to leave out some more of this fascinating stuff <laughs> and see if I can't get us to the end um, in fact, I'm going to leave my manuscript except for the last page because it just goes on and on forever like Aristotle's universe. <laughs> Lewis, in his um, book Miracles, um, by the way, Dorothy L. Sayers had said, what we need is someone who will defend the idea of miracles, and you, Mr. Lewis, are the man to do it. So do it. And so his philosophical apologetics he did because he was instructed to do them. Um, his other apologetics, his storytelling, were the ones he did because he wanted to do them. But he, he, he followed her instructions, and he did miracles. And in miracles, he said, if you can just show one exception um, to the rule, the naturalist rule that uh, all causes are physical, natural causes. 
then you've debunked naturalism and materialism and you've demonstrated there is the miraculous. There is something other than the physical. And so um, he gave the human mind is the example of something that cannot be explained by natural causes. Um, and he's going to the science of the day to, to, for his undergirding and he's going to uh, quantum theory where um, you don't have certainty, you have probability. But you don't know what any particular atom is going to do. You can do law of averages and say, we know that in this experiment, 50% of the atoms will do this and 50% will do that. But we don't know which ones will do what. It's all random. It's all chance. It's all irrational. So if at the base of the universe you have irrationality, you cannot get rationality from that. That's his argument. By the way, Lewis did not know this, and most people aren't aware of it, but for Charles Darwin, this was the big fly in the ointment of natural selection. Um, and he said that the, the, in his private correspondence, he never did this in, in public, but in his private correspondence, the mind gave him nightmares because he could not make the human mind fit into natural selection. But anyway, Lewis is pointing to the science. So Lewis does not see a conflict between science and biblical faith because the author of the Bible is the creator of the universe and science describes the behavior of the physical world. That's all it can do. It, can't, it has no tools to wonder about other than the physical. But that's what it does. Um, and so Lewis is, is fighting um, this battle against materialism and naturalism. He's not fighting a battle against science. For, for Lewis, this business of wonder that Jerry mentioned earlier is something he's experiencing in all of nature. And science is a way of looking at nature, uh, God's creation. So, um, as long as these issues percolate within our culture, and they're certainly ripe within our culture today, uh, then the work of C.S. Lewis is going to be relevant, and it's going to answer questions people are dealing with, and I think it's one reason why we find that his sales are going up and not down. Um, and uh, so, I think we'll have Lewis around for a good long time later until the victory's won. Now, I was supposed to talk about science and technology. So, the second half of my lecture will be on technology. We should note that C.S. Lewis could turn on a light switch. And because he had an aga at the kilns, this unusual English kind of a stove that's always turned on, never turned off, has no knobs to adjust high, low, medium. It's always going full blast. Because of that, he could also boil water. I thank you. Well, I know that was not only instructive, but uh, very illuminating as well. And so thank you very much, Hal. That was very, very helpful to us. Well, the time has come when we will break, and dinner starts at 545, so you have a little over an hour. Now, I do have to warn you that the forecast is, and it already has started a little bit, but the forecast is for rain, and it may even get a little bit heavier this evening. So be prepared for that. So if you're not going to dinner, well, then just stay here and everything will be all right. No, not really. But uh, anyway, we do look forward. This evening, I think, will be one of the high points of our symposium with Doug Gresham looking at the transition from 
the novels, into film, even the latest matters with Netflix and so forth. So this will be an unparalleled opportunity. So thank you. We'll see you.